Welcome to module 30 of Accounting 5000. This is the last module, and in the module we'll talk about chapter 16 of your textbook, which has two major topic areas. The first one talks about relevant costs and how they are used for making special types of decisions. The second part of the chapter talks about capital budgeting decisions and the different techniques we use to make capital budgeting decisions. So we'll briefly go through each of those two topics, and we'll work a problem or two on each one of those topics. So let's start out by talking about special decisions that we make in relationship to our whole idea of planning, control, and planning again. Remember when our planning process, we go through and decide what we're going to do. We then initiate those plans and carry them out. Then we look and see how well we've done, and we come back to the planning process again. What we're looking at in this part is where we're looking at special things that happen that fit outside this particular circle, but yet are an integral part of that circle. Special decisions that often occur when you're looking at things like, do we want to make or buy this product? Perhaps it's a piece of, a, of one of your products that you decide, maybe we'd be better off making it, or perhaps we could buy it cheaper outside. Or perhaps you have a different decision in which a company wants to purchase some of your products at a special price. You're not working at full capacity, so you may be able to put, fit their extra order in, and you may be able to give them a price break on that. So these are things that are incur occurring within your planning and control cycle, but yet they may not fit exactly into the process that you're used to talking about. So what we're going to have to do is look at the costs that are going to differ from whether we're going to accept that activity or make or buy that product versus what we're doing now. Anything that differs is called a differential cost. And those differential costs are the only things we're really going to look at when we're trying to decide which activity to follow. Remember again, just like with our fixed overhead, we do not use allocated costs in these types of decisions, simply because allocated costs don't work the way you would expect them to. They're going to remain regardless of which decision we make, so they're not really relevant. The only costs we're going to look at are relevant costs or the costs that are going to differ from one activity to another. For example, if we're going to make the product, certain costs will stay. If we're going to buy the product outside, some of those costs will go away, but some of the costs will stay. So we'll only look at the costs that change depending on whether we make the product or buy the product. So we're only looking at those differential costs that are relevant to our decision. The president's salary would not be relevant. That will not change based on which activity we take. However, our direct labor may change. Perhaps our variable overhead will change. Those would be relevant costs, and they would make a difference in our decision. So one of the things we're going to look at is, okay, we have this extra capacity in our plant. Perhaps we could accept a special order. In that case, that would be something we would consider in looking only at the relevant costs, which would be just the variable costs involved in making that product. Perhaps we can look at a process where we're making some, a product starting from the very beginning. Perhaps we could process that product a little bit further and have something even better and sell for a higher price. Is it worth our effort to sell that at the point we are now or to sell it after we process it a little further? Again, we're only going to look at those costs that differ between the two choices there. So we're going to look at differential costs and opportunity costs. These are relevant costs. These are the things that are going to make a difference. Opportunity costs are those costs that you give up by taking another action. For example, you're giving up certain costs of wages that you could earn by sitting in the classroom. That's an opportunity cost. The costs we're not going to look at are what we call irrelevant costs, and those are those allocated costs like fixed overhead we talked about before, and also sunk costs. Some costs are not relevant because they've already been expensed. We can't get them back. They're sunk. And a lot of managers make bad decisions because they include in their analysis sunk costs, costs that have already been expended. We don't want to do that. We only want to look at costs that are going to change based on our decision. So what kind of costs are we talking about? What kind of decisions are we looking at? For example, perhaps we have a special offer from somebody to make a product for them at below our normal price. Perhaps we want to uh, process a product a little further rather than where we are now, process it further and sell it for more money. In those cases, we need to know what our operating capacity is 
and where we are in relationship to that total operating capacity as to whether we can produce those or not, whether we have room to do it, time to do that or not. So those are the one types of things that we're going to talk about. Special decisions, make or buy, add a new product, that sort of thing. The second topic we're going to talk about are what we call capital budgeting decisions. Let's draw a distinction between a capital budget and an operating budget. Everything we've talked about before was an operating budget, which was typically for a year, and it was things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. A capital budget, budget, however, looks at bigger types of investments, things like new equipment, new land, plants, things like that we want to do long range. So capital budgeting is looking at long range decisions. And we want to see if we're investing a big bunch of money, how that money is going to return to us. Are we going to get our money back? So in order to evaluate those capital budgeting decisions, we have a different type of analysis that we do in looking at those. Some of them that we consider are cost of capital. Remember, a company has to borrow money to do a lot of its activities. In order to borrow that money, they have to pay interest. The cost of that is called cost of capital. We include in the cost of capital any return we have to pay to our stockholders also. How you come up with a firm's cost of capital is pretty complicated. Just remember that we will be given that in this course. They will tell you what the cost of capital is. And it will be based on the return for their interest and the return to their stockholders. Now this cost of capital is often called the discount rate. We may be using it very similar to what we did with our time value of money discount rate. And typically this will range between 10 and 20 percent. So usually the cost of capital will be somewhere in that range and you won't find anything much outside those two ideas. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at four methods of computing whether our investment is worthwhile. We're going to use what we call the net present value method, which uses present value analysis, just like we did in the previous module. We're going to look at an internal rate of return model, which also uses present value techniques. We're going to look at two methods that do not use present value. A payback method, which is very, pretty much very simple, simply looking at how long it takes you to get your money back. And then an accounting rate of return, which is based on your financial statements, looking at net income from a financial viewpoint. So there, typically there are four types that we're going to use. Now what are we going to have to know? In order to do our analysis, we have to know what our investment's going to cost us. In other words, what's our cash outflow going to be for this investment? We then have to know some sort of discount rate. In other words, what kind of rate of return are we looking at? We'll also have to know a time period in which we're looking at a payback or a retooling of a refunding of this investment. So we'll need to know those types of variables. In the net present value, all we're looking at is the outflow of cash, which we're paying out for the investment, and comparing that to the flow that's going to come back in through cash based on that investment. Now because there's time involved and there's interest involved, we're going to discount the cash coming back in and compare it to, in total, to our outlay of cash, which is typically right now, so it wouldn't, be to, wouldn't have to be discounted. So we're going to compare two numbers, our outflow and our series of inflows, and we're going to discount those inflows. That's why it's called net. You're adding your outflow to your inflows. And the present value part is the net present value of that particular approach. An internal rate of return, in this case we don't know the discount method. In other words, we don't know whether it's 10% or 5%. We go through and figure that. And this tells us what kind of return we're going to get on our particular investment. And typically a firm has a cutoff rate, say a 10% or 15% discount rate, which must be met in order for the project to be accepted. So a company will analyze various investments, come up with an IRR for each investment, and then we typically have a cutoff of, say, 10%. And everything that has an IRR of better than 10% is equally available to be invested in. Some of the things you need to be aware of, we're looking at estimates here. We're estimating the inflows of cash. We're estimating the discount rates in some cases. And we're looking at things in the future. So things can change quite rapidly. 
So be aware that some of the things we're looking at may not be carved in stone. These are just variables that we're looking at that can change over time. Cash may change, the value of our investment may change, and one of the things we have to look at that we often don't look at when, in our particular problems today is the tax consequences of what we do, because remember depreciation can be taken on equipment which can decrease our tax liability. So often we will ignore that or it will be included in the data, but in real life you need to include the idea that you're going to get some tax benefits from some of the types of investments that you make. Realize too there's a limited amount of money that a company can use to make these investments. It depends on how much money they can borrow, what their working capital needs are, things like that they need to consider other than just does it have a good rate of return, is it feasible for our company. One of the methods I really like because it doesn't involve an, a present value, you can do it very quickly, it's just called a payback method, in which case you look at how much you're going to pay out, what your return is going to be each year, and you decide how many years it's going to take you to get your money back. I did something similar to this when I decided to buy a refrigerator for my office. I bought one of those little uh, two quarts or two gallon cubic size refrigerators. It was cheap, it was only like $80, but by buying that I was able to buy my own soft drinks at a much cheaper price than I could buy them from the vending machines. So I took the difference between what I had to pay at the vending machine and what I could buy them for took that difference and figured out how many I drank a week, took, figured out how long it would take me to pay back that purchase of the refrigerator. And it took me like three semesters. So after three semesters, I had earned my money back on that refrigerator. So that gave me an idea that, yeah, it was a worthwhile investment. On the other hand, if it had taken me like 10 years to get my money back, the refrigerator probably wouldn't last 10 years. So in that case, I wouldn't have invested in the refrigerator. So that just gives you an idea of how to do that. In the accounting rate of return method, we're simply looking again at the financial statement perspective. How does it of, of investment affect a particular financial statement, particularly the income statement and occasionally the balance sheet? And you do it every year. Remember too that you don't use the time value of money, so it kind of has a distorted feature to it because you're not realizing that the money you're paying out now is worth more than the money you're getting back five years from now. Investors like to see these, though, because it does give them an idea of the impact of an investment on their future cash flow possibilities for dividends and interest. So there is different methods that we can use in capital uh, budgeting to analyze our decisions. We will probably want to look at the numbers, but we'll also want to look at some other factors, such things as is it worth our while, how much investment does it take in time, not just in dollars. How much of our limited resources will it consume? In other words, our manager's time, our employee's time. Is this something that we'll have to work out with our lenders? Will it increase our debt to equity ratio? How will that affect our lending rates? There are a number of various factors that you need to consider besides just the numbers that you crunch when you come up with an IRR or a net present value or a payback period. You need to look at other things. Take the whole picture, not just one particular thing. So let's do a little bit of exercise in these two areas. Let's start out by looking at exercise three in your textbook. Exercise three is near the top of page 591. And what we're looking at here is one of our special decisions. And this particular one is, should we sell a product now, or should we do some more stuff to it and sell it for a higher price after we've done special things to it? For example, instead of selling an unfinished piece of furniture for $5, should we finish it and sell it for $10? Does it cost us more to do the finishing product than we're going to get back? So that's what's involved here in this one. You have a chemical company that manufactures a chemical compound that it sells for $58 a gallon. They have a new variant of this chemical and they can sell it for $72 a gallon, but it's going to cost them $150,000 to make 10,000 of these new gallons. So what we're only going to look at are the things that are going to change. The things that are going to change are the selling price from $58 to $72. So that's a $14 per unit increase in our revenue. How much is it going to cost us? Well, we're going to have to spend another $150,000 for those 10,000 units, which is $15 a unit. So it's actually going to cost us $15 a unit to earn an additional $14. That doesn't make any sense, does it? We're going to lose a dollar if we go ahead and process it. So there's no point in processing further. We make more money selling it 
as it is. And you'll often find that to be true. This is used a lot in meat cat packing companies where they decide is it easier to sell the raw beef or to chop it up and sell it into component parts. Uh, you see this in manufacturing concerns. Is it easier to sell a product now or to spiff it up and sell it at a better price? Lots of times it's not worth their trouble to do it any further, to go ahead and sell it at the, at the first stage and make a better profit on it. Let's look at another problem. In this case, let's look at uh, problem five, which is at the very bottom of page 591. This is another type of special decision. This is one of whether they should accept a special order or not. I think you may be able to re relate to this if you think about a canning company. Let's say Campbell Soup. I'm just picking one out of the air. Campbell Soup processes their soups. They make all their vegetable soup at one time in one plant. And let's assume Kroger comes to them and says, we'd like for you to make our Kroger brand vegetable soup in your plant, but we're going to have to ask you to charge us less for it, and we're going to put our special label on it. Does Campbell want to accept that special order? process a soup, put a different label on it, and sell it to Kroger for a less price. What Campbell would do would be to look at their processing plant, see if they had the extra capacity, in other words, they have extra equipment they're not using, extra time they could use to make that soup. They would only look at the variable cost and see if their variable cost were less than the cost that Kroger was offering per can of soup. That's a special order. And a lot of different types of companies will do this. If you look at most Grocery stores, they have what we call store brands. Food City, Food Lion, Kroger, Winn-Dixie, all have their own particular type of store brands. Lots of times, these are done in other manufacturing plants that are producing a name brand of some kind. They're just putting a different label on it and charging them a different price. Sometimes the manufacturing process is different. Sometimes the ingredients are different. That they're by making a distinction between the Campbell's and the Kroger brand soup. So let's look at this particular problem and see what's happening. You have a company that's currently operating only at 50% capacity, so they could be making twice as much stuff. They're making 50,000 units of a patented electric component. They give you the cost of that component there. And on the next page, they say a Japanese firm is offered to buy 30,000 of these components for $6 a unit. The normal price they sell it for is $8. The price will not affect any of their normal business. In other words, this will not siphon off any of the business from their regular customers, so they, it will not destroy their current operating status. This special order will not affect their business, and it's calculated that uh, the component actually costs them $7, so they don't want to accept the offer. So the first thing they ask you is, okay, where did management come up with that $7? Well, if you flick back to the bottom of the page, it says that raw materials are a dollar and a half, Direct labor is a dollar and a half. Variable overhead is two dollars. And what management has done is they've taken fixed overhead of hundred thousand dollars and divided it by their fifty thousand units, and they've come up with a unitized fixed overhead or a unit amount for each over fixed overhead of two dollars. So that totals up to seven dollars. So that's where f management came up with the seven dollars. Now what they want you to do next is to evaluate that seven dollars. You do not want to include that fixed cost. That fixed cost stays there regardless of whether they make 50,000 units or the 80,000, which would be the 50 plus the additional 30. It's going to stay the same. So that cost is not relevant to their decision. And again, you don't try to unitize fixed costs. So how are we going to figure out how much the variable costs on this component are? Take all of the costs except the fixed overhead. So you would take the dollar and a half for materials, a dollar and a half for labor, and the two dollars for variable overhead, you would get five dollars as a cost for that product. If they're going to sell it for six dollars, they're going to make a dollar per unit. So in this case, they would accept the special order because they will be making more money. They're making a dollar revenue per unit, which would be an additional thirty thousand dollars in profit. So those two are an example of how you'd make special decisions. You're also assigned exercise seven on page 592 of your book. It's very similar to the other two that we just worked. So I'm going to leave that for you to work on your own. You have the solutions in your handout. Uh, go through, work it out yourself, and then check your answer with the solution and see how you did. See if you've got a good handle on these types of special decisions. So let's work some problems then on the 
capital budgeting area. And let's use as our first problem, problem 15, which is in your book at the bottom of page 594. In this case, they want us to calculate net present value and compare it to internal rate of return. You have a company that's considering an investment of $85,000 in a new machine. So that's what they're going to pay out in cash. The machine's going to generate cash flow of $14,000 a year each year for eight years. And at the end of that time, it's going to have a $9,000 salvage value. They'll be able to sell it for $9,000. The company's cost of capital is 10%. So they ask you to calculate the net present value of the proposed investment and to ignore taxes. Now, again, that's not a good idea, but in this case, we're going to. Let's back up one here. We're going to compare our outflow of $85,000, cash out, to the inflow of $14,000 a year for how many years are we going to do it? Eight years at 10%. So we're going to look that number up in our um, pay present value tables. I've listed for you there. I think it's table 6-3. We're going to get 74689 That's going to be coming back in cash flow from this investment. Plus, we're going to be able to get another 9000 back when we sell that equipment at the end of its useful life. Take the present value of that eight years from now, it would be $4,198. So what we're going to get back is not quite enough to cover what we're paying out right now. We're going to get back $6,113 less than our payout. So it doesn't seem like a good investment. Since the pre net present value is negative, we know that the internal rate of return is going to be less than the 10% cost of capital. So again, this would not be a reason to invest in this particular activity. You're assigned problem 21 also in this chapter. Problem 21 is at the bottom of page 597. It has you do calculate net present value, present value ratio, and payback. I've given you the answer to that one in your handout also. That's a good test problem for you to kind of work them through yourself and then check your answers against the handout. So we'll leave that one for you to do. And we're going to work one more similar to that to give you an idea of what it look like, looks like. Let's look at problem 22. This is on page 598 near the very top of the page. What we have here is a company that is uh, evaluating purchasing a sewing machine. So you're going to calculate net present value, the present value ratio, and payback, very similar to the one we skipped over. Let's see how we would do that. They give, you, give us the production volumes for each of the five years of the machine's life. They tell us the price of the machine is $66,000 plus $4,200 to get it in place ready to use, so that's an additional cost of the machine. The caps have a contribution margin of $4.20 per dozen, and the fixed costs other than depreciation are not important, and their cost of capital has been set at 16%. So what you're going to have to do is figure the present value of those cash flows for 2003 through 2007. So what I've done is gone through, take the number of dozen caps we're going to produce. For example, in 2003, we're producing 3,000 caps. Each of those caps is going to produce a contribution margin of $4.20. So that's $12,600. You discount that for one period at 16%. That gives you a factor of 0.8621. So you multiply that by your 12.6 and you get $10,862 present value cash inflow in 2003. In 2004, you're going to make 4,700 dozen hats at $4.20 contribution margin. You discount that for two periods at 16%, you come up with 14,671. You repeat that process for four, five, six, and seven. And then finally, what you do is you add up all those present values you've calculated, and you get total inflows of $86,440. That's what you're going to have coming in. What you've got going out is your total investment there, 66000 plus 4200 You're going to pay out 70200 to get this investment. So you're going to end up with a net present value of $16,240. In Part B of the problem, what they want you to do is to do the present value ratio, which takes the present value inflows and divide it by the investment. It's just a relationship of those two calculated numbers. 86,440 divided by 70,200, which gives you a 1.23. You want anything higher than one. You want to get back more than you're investing. In this case, you're getting back nearly 23% more. 
In Part C, they ask us to figure the internal rate of return relative to the cost. Well, obviously, the IRR is more than the cost of capital because your net present value is positive. And the PV ratio we just figured up there in B is higher than 1, so it must be a better return. And then finally, what they want us to do in Part D here is to calculate the payback period. Now, remember, this doesn't use present value. All you're doing is taking your investment and dividing it by the return you're going to get. So you can use those same numbers you calculated in Part A, but don't net present value them. So you're going to take your $70,200 investment. You'll subtract out the number of dozen caps you're making times their contribution margin, which was $12,600. That leaves you $57,600 that you still have left to cover. So the second year, you take that 57.6 and subtract out the number of caps you're going to make times the contribution margin, which gives you 19,740. That still leaves you with $37,860 to cover. So the third year, you take your contribution margin times the number of caps you're going to make, 29,820 from 37,860. You still have $8,040 left to cover. So in the fourth year, you figure your number of caps times your contribution margin and subtract that from $8,000 and you've finally gone over the top. So it's going to take you a little more than three years to get your money back. To figure the three years, I simply took the amount that was left after the third year, the $8,040, and divided it by the amount that I would be receiving in year four, which was $39,480, and I got 0.2. So it takes me about 3.2 years to get my money back from my investment. Now remember, that does not include any present value calculations, just how long it takes me to get it back. So it actually would probably take me a little bit longer than that if we were looking at present values of the numbers. It would decrease our return each year, and it might take closer to four years. So that's still a good time for a return on an investment of that size. So what we've done in Chapter 16 is look at two particular areas. We've looked at special types of decisions where we're only looking at relevant costs, differential costs, and then we looked at capital budgeting decisions where we looked at net present value and payback periods specifically, and we talked about the other methods of evaluating capital budgeting decisions. You're now ready to take your third exam from these chapters, which will be chapters 21 through 30, and after you take that exam, you'll be ready to take your final exam, which will cover the entire book, and then we'll make sure you've got all your cases turned in, all your other assignments, and we'll finish up the, the uh, course for you.